Welcome to the 16th episode of the Undisciplined Podcast. I am your host, as always, Dr. Nico Beitendach. It's been a while since I've had an episode, so I'm glad to finally get one out again. I've been quite busy, and as I think those of you who've been here for a while can deduce, this podcast is a pet project of mine. It means I can't bring you content every week like many podcasts do. The point is, is that I only do this when there's someone I really want to talk to and who I think is worth having on. I'm not making episodes for the sake of it, and I hope it shows. I've also been quite busy with my own projects. The biggest one is my first monograph that will come out in January. And I'm also developing some new, hopefully exciting directions that Undiscipline can go into. It's not quite at the point yet where I want to make public exactly what it will look like, but suffice it to say that I am working on some new ideas and I will share that with you soon. And hopefully it's something that you will enjoy and take some value from. Anyway, Today, I'm talking to Dr. Christian Morgner from Sheffield University, in particular about a book that he translated and edited. It's a collection of essays or articles by Niklas Luhmann, and he compiled them into the volume entitled The Making of Meaning from the Individual to Social Order. These are all taken from Luhmann's series called Semantics and Social Structure, and the essays that Dr. Morgner included in here are all extremely interesting and, I think, relevant to our contemporary situation. The book came out earlier this year with Oxford University Press, and I talk with Dr. Morgner more about how he translated and the content of the various essays. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for sticking with Undisciplined and enjoy the rest of the episode. Okay, Christian, thank you very much for talking to me today. I'm very honored to have you here. Um, you just very recently published a book, The, Me Ma the Making of Meaning, which contains some of your own work as well as a lot of translations from Niklas Luhmann. So before we delve straight into the book, it's my tradition to ask guests first to introduce themselves a little bit, especially their academic background. And maybe also what would be interesting to hear is how you became interested in Luhmann in particular. Thank you, Nico. Thanks for thanks so much for the invite. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so by training, I'm a sociologist. Um, I've studied sociology in my undergraduate and master's levels and actually came across Luhmann at uh, quite an early stage in my undergraduate studies. I think I was in the first semester of my second year and like it's been a typical introductory um, seminar on contemporary soci sociological theory, I think it was. And I was actually meant to give a presentation um, on Luhmann. Um, I had no, I had no idea who Nicholas Luhmann was at the time. So really, so, you know, at the time, somehow by accident, that I stumbled across this work. But I think what is personally quite interesting is that the text I had to present or talk about is also the right text that forms the core of the book that I've published now sort of 20 years later. So it's coming all in full circle. Um, so in a sense, I discovered Luhmann quite early in my sociological studies and was quite intrigued you know, by, the, by the complexity of um, his sociological approach. But then I think my studies at the time were all around quite theoretical and quite conceptual. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't just Luhmann. Um, I mean, I was also reading quite a number of other sociological thinkers at the time, Noel Elias, Jürgen Habermas, Karl Marx, Max Weber, and so forth. So there was really something like a very strong sociological grounding um, in terms of you know, reading also these thinkers in terms of the their original publications and their original texts, so not just through textbooks. And I found that quite intriguing because it really you know, challenged your 
everyday understanding of the social world and how we interact with others and so forth. So I think that was quite intriguing. And therefore, I kind of, you know, follow that thinking because it seems, you know, to offer something where you can think out of the box, sort of, you know, beyond your um, typical perceptions of the social world. And I think it stayed with me that I always, sort of, you know, wanted not just to become some sort of, you know, armchair social theorist that it's just, you know, rereading existing literature. But I always had a very strong interest in combining it with empirical research. Either sort of, you know, empirical research being at the very beginning and stimulating conceptual thinking, or sort of, you know, having certain conceptual ideas and then seeing sort of, you know, how they can be explored empirically. Um, so for instance, in my master's dissertation at the time, um, I wrote on published, you know, wrote the text on trust. Um, and I was quite interested in particular in the role of trust in the transformation of Eastern Germany at the time and the role of the church as a kind of, you know, institution that offered a lot of trust within the political system that was largely being deep, be detrusted. And therefore, so, you know, for instance, you know, providing a place of congregation where people could meet quite safely and discuss in a sense, um, you know, the political state and political fates of, you know, of Eastern Germany. Um, I was, you know, collected a lot of um, empirical data at the time and so forth. And I found it really sort of, you know, intriguing and kind of, you know, then developed this further. Um, so also, for instance, in my PhD, I worked on global media events, um, which in a sense combined an interest in um, network research on uh, media messages. I'd likewise sort of, you know, also looked into the production of meaning making. Right, so if you know these networks of you know media messages and how they're interlinked and how so if you know meaning is being mediated and transferred from one message to the other within a so if you know, really short time frame, but also at the global scale. Um, and I remember so if you know for the research, I traveled to archives in the US, I traveled to archives in Singapore and in Germany and so forth, and all the so if you know to also um, provide and you know develop the kind of empirical evidence and data so that the theory is not just, I don't know, a mere illustration of the data and vice versa, but really, so if, you know, they speak to each other quite at eye level and that the data is really challenging the theory and the theories so can also, you know, grow because you know, it's been challenged by something, you know, it, it's, it's been tested with. Um, and so in a sense, because, you know, having worked across these topics and with the variety of different methods and conceptual ideas, I was always quite flexible in terms of my own um, academic biography. So I then, you know, work later on in, I don't know, history departments, language departments, um, you know, so more in the humanities, but then also work at sociology departments, communication departments. And currently I'm a senior lecturer um, or like an associate professor if you use the US system in a management school. Um, so in a sense of, you know, thinking of, you know, quite globally and, and you know, looking at these subjects from such an interdisciplinary perspective has enabled me to work across a variety of different academic disciplines because I think you know, the notion of meaning is something that is quite important for all of these disciplines. I don't know, be it in history, for instance, you know, how we narrate history, so you know, how we construct you know, historical narratives and so forth. Meaning is very important. You, know, you work in the language department. Obviously, so, you know, the semantics and translations and meanings are very, very important. And likewise, so, you know, in a, in a communication or even so, you know, in a management school, right? so, you know, the way we think about uh, so, you know, innovation, you know, new meanings so, you know, come to the world and you know, meanings being transformed within organizational context, you know, the whole tradition around sense making. Um, so that's something so, as a kind of you know, trajectory that... Um, I've tried to develop further and in a sense of it has informed the work on the book project um, that you've mentioned. Thank you. This centrality of meaning in your research connects very nicely with this book. And speaking about that now, there's always been a kind of a steady stream of translations from the German to the English of Luhmann's work. And of course, also other languages too. But I get the impression from from your volume that you chose the texts to include into the translation very uh, carefully and that these texts all hang together under a certain theme with a clear goal in mind. And I think that you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like that you are trying to present 
a side of Luhmann that perhaps German scholars knew, already knew, but that is from unfamiliar to English scholars on Luhmann, those who don't have the ability to go back to the German texts. Am, am I right with this? What what was the, the, the central theme of, of the selections that you made? And what were you trying to show in all these other translations that are happening? What were you trying to put forward to at least the English academic community? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Thank you, Nico. I think there are two elements that, um, so, you know, two ideas that really inform the selection of the text in that book but then also that book project um, overall. So one of these elements is that is when we look at the presentation of Luhmann's work, I think in you know, 99% of the you know, different academic contexts, be it sociology, be it under the management and education and whatever he's received, it's typically seen as system theory, right? So that keyword system is you know, being used um, pretty much all the time. Um, and I also you know, felt a little bit unease with that presentation because, you know, we're looking here at the scholar with the work, you know, a time span over 40 years, having published, you know, so and so many publications. And it all seems to be, you know, reduced to this one label, to this one term. And I think, you know, that seemed, so, you know, maybe something useful, you know, for the purpose of an you know, introductory handbook you know into sociology but then um it you know comes at the danger that so you know you start to neglect the complexity and you know all the other areas and all the other ideas that the particular scholar has to offer so in a sense it's not just something that applies necessarily to luma that kind of tendency to use these sort of labels right you see it with others i don't know parsons as you know being a functionalist or you know marxism and so forth and then you know immediately certain concepts and ideas you know pop into our minds for the reason that others of you know remain in the shadows and so in that sense of you know i felt it's a bit of a problematic reading because just you know seeing luman as a system theorist ignores you know certain parts of his of his work of his thinking uh well he actually you know, didn't use the word system right and what he's you know, even himself sort of you know was sometimes a bit at unease when he uh, spoke at a certain conference or gave a paper, he didn't use the word system in that presentation at all and was still being introduced as a system theorist. So it also you know, kind of like raised eyebrows on his side and you know, some of his um, students reported that he even sort of you know, uh, turned it into a bit of a um, joking exercise that he wouldn't write papers uh, or like you know, would do presentations without the word system in there at all and still sort of, you know, being being presented as such. So I think, you know, there's on the one hand something that informed this book project, what is to a certain extent a criticism of that sociological approach to how we present great thinkers and, you know, using sometimes overtly narrow labels um, and thereby sort of, you know, ignoring um, certain other traditions. And the role of meaning, sort of, you know, is one of these concepts that is actually really, really central for Lumen and becomes therefore easily ignored. And just to give an example, I mean, in the early debate that he had with Jürgen Habermas in 1971, so if you know where these you know, two great scholars met and discussed, so if you know, their different theoretical approaches, um, which, you know, later became published as a book, um, Luhmann wrote a text in there, which is called Meaning as a Basic Concept. So he didn't publish actually a text in there, which is called System as a basic concept. He never published actually such a text, if you know, where he puts, if you know, that centrality to the term um, system. So we can see, so if you know, already there are other concepts where he thought they're really actually quite central for my thinking, so if you know, how ideas, so if you know, with a variety of different problems, but they are, let's say, so if you know, neglected, if you just, so if you know, view a scholar under a particular label. The other element is also that, obviously, you know, the term or the word system, and I think this is potentially something that applies more so to the Anglo-American context, as, as, as quite a negative connotation. So, you know, systems are being seen as something quite static, uh, as something, I don't know, machine-like, and so forth, that seem to be, I don't know, against freedom, against, I don't know, human creativity, and so forth, all right? So, in particular, stuff, you know, where they, in the aftermath of, I don't know, 
you know, Tarquist Parsons' work and, you know, um, sort of, you know, his work sort of you know, falling out of favor. That not only applies to this particular scholar, but it seems to me also applied to the term systems overall. Right. So enough, you know, as soon as people might hear, oh, you know, the word system, they think of it in the kind of, you know, negative terms. And then also, you know, maybe ignore the work of a particular scholar if they think it's being associated with this. So I think, so, you know, it's kind of, I think, you know, trying being critical of these readings, of these traditions, of these presentations, you know, which neglects, you know, really, really important parts of, you know, of a particular thinker. And like I said, so, you know, meaning being one of them. The other elements of, you know, like I said, so, you know, there are two elements that inform this book. The other one, the second one is what we also have this tendency when we think of a social theorist, right, you know, we immediately sort of, you know, imagine potentially someone who is kind of like an armchair philosopher who isn't sort of, you know, really engaging with the world. You know, they're sitting at home, you know, I don't know, looking at the sky, looking at the stars, if, you know, thinking about the world, you know, just reading books and so forth. And I think, you know, collecting these works, I was I was also quite intentional in a sense to to deal with this particular reading because Luma was actually you know, one of those social theorists who was also extremely empirical. Um, I mean, so you know, in his work, he was involved in a large quantitative survey that he conducted on reforms of um, public administration in Germany, uh, which was published as a book, and several of you know journal papers came out of it. Um, so it's like, you know, quantitative skills were also at his disposal. Um, for the book on um, love, you know, he spent several months in archives in Paris. Um, so, you know, reading all that archival materials, a project, you know, similar to the works of Norbert Elias or Michel Foucault in terms of his um, skill set. Um, and he was also, you know, very much an ethnographer, you know, traveling the world and, you know, trying to see things for you know, his own eyes and really you know, experiencing these matters. And I think, you know, that book project is then also meant to kind of, you know, showcase more his empirical thinking, right? So, you know, to see actually how skillful he was when he dealt with all that historical material, right? His, really, so, you know, his skill in a sense at reading, so, you know, all these old documents, interpreting, ordering them, analyzing them, and so forth, um, and not just if, you know glossing over by using like a certain number of theoretical uh, contact uh, concepts. So you can really see also, you know, that the sociologist, you know, Luma and stuff, you know, is coming through in these texts, you know, by being able you know, to deal with all this um, empirical data. And I think that you know these two developments, you know, focusing on the aspect of meaning, so you know, as another really central aspect, and something I think which will also really be, you know. Um, could be well connected to the Anglophone context, but then likewise also, you know, that more empirical thinking is potentially something that could build riches, um, you know, into his work and, you know, make others more interested in actually, you know, reading it. It's funny that you mentioned this connection that, you know, how a single term can get connected to a thinker because I'm right now busy reading again in the field of legal theory. I'm reading Hans Kelsen's famous A Pure Theory of Law. And, you know, for even an undergraduate law student, Kelsen is equal to the idea of the Grundnorm. And when you read A Pure Theory of Law, the term doesn't come up that much at all, actually. Uh, I think he he has, it's it's definitely there and, 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 and part of it, but I don't even think it's the central idea that he has when I read A Pure Theory of Law. So, Immediately, you know, because I'm I'm reading that stuff like this week every day, so that exactly that idea has come up too with this idea of systems and Luma and, and Kelsen and the Grundnorm. But anyway, so you 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 talk about meaning, and then you also mention Luma's command of historical material, and what these essays show is his mode of thinking being actually a very historical one almost another name you mentioned i always forgot that almost in this Foucauldian way this very historical lens through which he looks at in his own work so i think i think this idea of meaning on the one hand and this historical approach on the other hand has very direct implications for how we understand knowledge and knowledge creation but why do you think they are especially relevant right now I think they're quite. Re I think they're really important or relevant right now, simply because when I think you know we would have to go back a bit in history, in order to understand why they're so relevant at the moment. And I think 
we are now at the at the point in time I think where some of the you know greatest of you know sociological projects that were concerned with what you might call a theory of society have to a certain extent largely disappeared from the field of sociology. So and I think when you for instance when you go back a bit in time and you look at the um, development of sociology in particular after World War Two, it was a it was a time of great expansion of sociology. So it was a time of great expansion in terms of, you know, all these new subfields of sociology emerged, you know, media sociology, educational sociology, political sociology. So none of that really sort of, you know, existed in, you know, the uh, the times of, you know, when sociology was founded as a discipline, where people were more concerned with what is the object of sociology, what makes sociology as a discipline, what are its methods, what are its institutions, what are its journals, and so forth, what does, you know, training look like. But now, I think, after World War II, sociology starts to react, in a sense, upon its own, right? So, you know, it has already, you know, built a certain standing, and now the question is, it kind of, you know, starts to look at what it has, you know, Tucker Parsons being someone who tries to fuse and merge, you know, existing sociological thinkers. But likewise, therefore, you know, you also see that now these kind of, you know, sub-disciplines um, emerge and you know, really greatly expand the field of sociology. And so, you know, while they're expanding, actually, it's also, so, you know, that particular period where the kind of, you know, niche, so, you know, emerge where people can engage with sociology from this really abstract and um you know perspective where they want to formulate a sociolo a sociological theory so if you know that can unite all these different subdisciplines. And that's not necessarily something that only happens in Germany at the time. So you know Lumont starts broadly with this in the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties and you see that tendency also in the work of Jürgen Habermas. But likewise, you know, you see similar stuff, you know, scholars in terms of, you know, age and academic career in other countries, I don't know, be Pierre Bourdieu Right, so Sofino you know, also published his main so, you know, works in the 1980s, like Luhmann, like Habermas. In the UK, you have Anthony Giddens, Sofino you know, similar, Sofino you know, academic biography, also you know, published his main theoretical work in the 1980s, or let's say, I don't know, in the US, James Coleman also published Sofino you know, his main Sofino you know, theoretical work on rational choice in the same period. All right, so it's quite interesting, so, you know, historically, when you look at that, they also you know, started to work on it in that field of great expansion because there was a niche, in a sense, for that kind of ac academic thinking. It was also seen so that there's a need so, you know, for uniting these different disciplines and subjects. And therefore, I think you see that you know, most of their uh, publications fall more or less within the same time frame. But then, you know, after the 1980s, once they have published so, you know, all these works, that kind of development, let's say, starts to stagger a little bit, or let's say, so, you know, there isn't such a great interest anymore in these, you know, very encompassing and so, you know, grand social projects. I mean, you still obviously you know you have sociological theory, but that, you know, particular type of, you know, um, theory of society isn't really, so, you know, a core project anymore. It kind of, so, you know, it's still there, and, you know, we're kind of, you know, rereading these traditions and sometimes, you know, rediscovering them, but there isn't really, so, you know, anyone who seriously pursues, so, you know, a similar project at that grand scale. So, and, so, you know, what does it obviously, you know, then mean for our situation today, right? So, you know, what we kind of, you know, starting now on a more social side, and let's say, so, you know, outside of academia, maybe more in public discourse and, you know, society itself to realize its own complexity, right? You know, all the challenges that we have, you know, be it in terms of ecological challenges, in terms of, you know, still you know, internal conflicts that can happen in the world, um, you know, um, large-scale social inequalities that we see and so forth. So really, so, you know, challenging situation that is being discovered. And the question is, how can we make sense of this? So, you know, how can we give you know meaning so, you know, to all these different, you know, very complex developments? And I think this is so, you know, what I feel that suddenly so, you know, that in particular that uh, meaning becomes uh, really, really interesting because suddenly so, you know, society finds itself in that situation, what is trying to you know grasp for that meaning, what is kind of you know trying to make so, you know, sense of itself, but it doesn't have sort of you know these these great projects anymore on which it can rely on right so therefore sort of you know it's kind of you know now sort of, you know, opening up various possibilities and as a great search sort of you know, for potential solutions and um 
you know, alternative ideas that can provide an explanation that can potentially provide a new type of uh, framework or new mode of thinking that is sort of, you know, quite up sort of, you know, for these complex changes that we're discovering in the 21st century. And I think this is sort of, you know, why the notion of meaning, I thought, is so really interesting and potentially quite fitting uh, for the situation of society that we're experiencing at the moment. Mm, this reminds me of... This is already a few months ago, but I think it was this year. The English newspaper, The Guardian, had a column, and I forgot who wrote it, but the writer was complaining that or one of the problems of society today is, is that, in his or her words, was that we had lost a shared sense of reality. And I thought, okay, that's true, but Luman already knew this decades ago. Uh, this is not news. But I, but I think, Sophina, it's kind of, going in a direction uh, sort of, you know, trying the point that I was making that let's say certain forms of you know descriptions of society as being you know a great collective or something that we share with all you know people around the world or like you know this notion of sharedness or collectiveness or I don't know we have, we agree with everybody or it's, it's being negotiated and so forth so I mean you know there, there are severe cracks right in in those descriptions and they don't really seem to work anymore uh, I mean, it be it because of the, we kind of, you know, start to realize the, the global size of society, you know, be it, you know, due to the influx of communication technologies. So I think, you know, there are certain developments definitely sort of, you know, but in society itself that, you know, kind of showcase this huge disparity between these traditional forms of how we describe and understand societies and how, you know, society presents itself. Um, and so, and I think, so, you know, in that gap, right, so, you know, some of these conceptions now become to the forefront, right, you know, the role of meaning. And you could say, I mean, if, you know, from the perspective of these kind of you know, traditional scholars, how can you make meaning in a world where you actually don't have to agree with anybody, where, you know, these kind of, you know, shared norms and values and cultures don't seem to exist? I mean, obviously, we're seeing it's not falling apart, right? It's, you know, society is still operating in whatever way. Um, so some sort of, you know, there are certain structures, um, mechanisms, operations in place, right, that, you know, um, enable that form of meaning making. Um, and the question is, you know, what are these? How do they work? Um, you know, how do they sort of, you know, deal with that, you know, enormous complexity that we start to discover, like with the global society and all these processes, right? And I think, so, you know, this is some of, some of the key questions of, you know, I, I found that book. Um, can make a contribution to. I want to shift direction, but only very slightly. While we're talking about kind of myths about Luman that are being challenged also in your work, one of these typical myths that you hear is that Luman, either you, you hear two versions. You hear the one version that Luman was politically conservative, and the other version that you hear is, is that actually his own political opinions are kind of hidden from his academic work or not present, right? I personally think after reading the, the articles that you collected that I think there is something of Luhmann's own politics that can be gleaned here. Uh, maybe not that explicitly, but also not it's, it's not completely absent either. Would you agree with this uh, assessment of mine? And what do you think more broadly are the political implications of these particular articles and 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 reading them together the way that you arrange them i think nico so if you know the answer if you know, to this depends a little bit on what we mean by the term political and i suppose there can be two readings of this or two answers to this let's say if we understand political as a you know more generalist term as let's say having a particular agenda Right, having a particular uh, preference in terms of that you would like to change the status quo, but then I think you know it seems to me really, really obvious that you know this is very much at the core of Luhmann's project. I mean, like it was called the Sociological Enlightenment, and you know he published more than fifty books and and uh, three hundred articles, and I can hardly imagine he wouldn't have done that if he had no interest in in making a difference. Uh, so I think, you know, even if, you know, that kind of, you know, writing is evidence uh, of, you know, having an interest in making a difference. But, you know, from the perspective of this more general understanding, I think one of the 
key interest was initially to make a difference to the field of sociology. All right, so if you know the way sociology uh, tries to conceptual conceptualize society in terms of the kind of empirical methods it's developing for its research and so forth. Really, so if you know, I think this is if you know where you see actually a very, very strong agenda and where he was always extremely critical and very outspoken in his publication, where he was also you know, at times quite, you know, confrontational, uh, you know, think about his text on political steering, right? You know, where the political scientists would say, um, or oh, there isn't, you know, we need, there isn't enough power in society, um, so, you know, with the state and no one said they're quite opposite or we need, we need more power. Right to make decisions, or you know, others. You know, when you read about this text, on memory, uh, memory is then there was a kind of a tradition at the time coming more from uh, archaeology and literary studies, saying, or oh, there is, you know, we need, you know, to memorize the past and memorize more, and then you know, everyone put an emphasis on forgetting as a key function, you know, for actually that you know, memorizing can take place at all. So you see, stuff, you know, there's definitely also quite a um, critical style in his writing when it comes to a variety of different academic traditions, you know, and wanting to move them forward, you know, wanting them to progress and, um, you know, having the right um, tools and the right concepts at hand in order to have a better grasp of the um, developments that, you know, occurring in what society and society itself. So I think that's definitely, definitely, definitely one of his um, intentions, which I think, you know, is quite clear throughout. If you sort of you know, have a more narrow understanding of the term political, you know, political as in the sense of, you know, the state or the nation state, then yeah, I think so if you know you you know, Luhmann wasn't someone who was always there in a sense who was quite outspoken, I don't know, saying something about certain political reforms. Um, but you can see so if, you know, at certain times and on certain occasions when it came to, I don't know, certain developments, you could be quite direct, uh, you know, when it comes to reform of, you know, public administration and so forth. So, I mean, there were definitely sort of, you know, things that, um, that mattered and what sort of, you know, what he, you know, mentioned criticism and provided solutions. But then on the other hand, I felt so, you know, he didn't so, you know, make this always extremely clear or mention it simply because I think there was a large agreement in terms of, you know, why you think, why you thought, so, you know, things would have to change, so, you know, even you know, in allegiance with Jürgen Habermas. So often I think, you know, the differences between the two are quite overplayed. And, um, you know, when it comes to, I don't know, reforming, you know, education or when it came to, I don't know, making certain, you know, changes to politics and so forth, I think largely the two of them would have agreed. So it was more, you know, in terms of the theoretical concepts that would, you know, underpin their thinking. This is, you know, where you would see differences. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, they kind of, you know, shared a lot in terms of, you know, their um, narrow understanding in terms of political reforms. And so you might, you know, then go to the third question. So what are the political implications of these texts? Well, so, you know, some of the political implications is definitely, so, you know, we, you know, we kind of start to see how some of these concepts, you know, that we seem to take in so much for granted nowadays actually have a very recent um, historical development. So, for instance, uh, we look at the term individual in there. It seems to have been a really strange to us nowadays to think how it could be any different, right? How could there be people in the world that wouldn't describe themselves in terms of, in terms of willpower, in terms of so, you know, you know, determining their own fate, so, you know, like having to build their own identities, so, you know, trying to figure out who they are. So, you know, all the challenges that we, you know, find, who are we, so, you know, what do we do? What's our place in the world? Uh, what does it mean to be a man? What does it, be, what it mean to be a woman? I don't know, the educational demands that we have nowadays to grow and to educate ourselves further. I mean, all that is probably about 200 years old. Right, so for you know the kind of six thousand years of you know human history, you know that wasn't sort of, you know something that societies were no, you know, really concerned with, um, you know individuality and you know developing yourself out of yourself. It must have been really strange, so you know, to people back then, if you would have asked them about their feelings and how do you feel and what does it mean to you and their inner beings, so you know, probably people would have probably are afraid. And and yeah. on the way, so if you know, if you had asked him these questions, so I think you see, so if you know, there, I think 
you know, Luhmann really comes to the forefront. And you could then, you know, even go a step further and then ask yourself, well, if these concepts have emerged in the past 200 years, what has been their impact, right, in terms of advantages and disadvantages? If you know, what, what has been the impact if we start to understand ourselves as individuals? You know, think about, like, mental health problems that experience nowadays. So on the one hand, it seems very beautiful, so if you know, to think, oh, you know, I've got all that freedom at my hands and, you know, figuring out who I am and so forth. But then, you know, more and more within the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, we're also starting to see the side effects of all of that, that it's not that easy, right? It can be very challenging. And there's a lot of, you know, mental health problems that we're now starting to discover because, you know, they used to be under that kind of, you know, stigma, but they're definitely sort of, you know, side effects of a concept that doesn't provide you stability from birth on because you really sort of, you know, have to figure it out along the way and yeah unfortunately sort of, you know within you know technology studies you've got all these institutions that try to figure out what is the impact of a certain technology you know what are the what are the dangers of nuclear energy but you could ask yourself the same questions what are the dangers of the invention of the individual right what are the dangers of the invention of the nation state and so forth so i mean and these are all really recent concepts and i think this is something where you can learn a lot i think from luman saying that something that has been taken for granted and seems to be sonoba is something rather quite recent and we haven't really understood you know the social consequences of operating and using uh, these concepts simply because i don't think so if you know we are aware of their recent historical development um, because you know, they seem to be as if they have been there for you know all humanity yeah that's interesting my own uh doctoral work was pretty much on the idea of, you know, this very recent uh, coming into being of the nation state and, you know, do we really understand it and what are the impacts of that? But anyway, so you bring us nicely into my next question, which talking about the individual and, you know, you're even talking about the mental anguish that individuality has given us, you break with a small tradition in this book where... In previous English translations of Luhmann, not the social systems, but the psychic systems have always been translated in English as psychic systems. And in your book, you break with this uh, with this tradition by changing psychic systems to psychical systems. Mm -hmm. So for those that did not or have not yet uh, read your introduction, do you mind explaining why you thought psychic systems was unsatisfactory and why you, you you chose to break away with psychical systems. It's interesting that when you look at the term, you know, that broadly describes um, mental activities, let's say, it's a term that is also changing in Lumen's works over time. So it isn't so if you know that he is using the same term for this across all his writings. So initially, um, I'd say I think we're talking here about the period of the 1960s and 1970s. He he calls them person systems. Um, so I think so. If you know, very much still, you know, coming from a you know action based conception of society, but you kind of you know already start to sense that person systems and social systems are different, right? So that is the kind of you know initial language that he's using. He's not using unlike I think Tucker Parsons who's using the word personality systems which has kind of like a closer psychological connection he's using the term person system you know because it seems for Luhmann more you know closer in a sense related to that as a social address you know someone who is being constructed like at the person at the other end um so i think this is something that very much informs this kind of you know, early thinking but then when he stuff you know started to introduce ideas more around self-referential things self-referential systems this kind of it seems sort of you know that what is what is what is necessary now is to identify how do these systems in a sense how do these different two different types of systems what kind of you know, elements produce them right so you know with the person system or with the social system they were both sort of you know constituted in a sense by the same element which were actions or meaningful actions, so to say. But once, you know, the notion of um, the self-referential moves more to the forefront, it becomes kind of, you know, clearer to him that um, conceptually you need to, you know, better able to identify 
what elements constitutes them. So if you know what what you know constitutes them as a system. So if you know what is their mode of meaning making, so to say, right? And most of you know that focus on you know what is their different mode of meaning making, then two other notions in a sense are a bit more pushed to the forefront. So which is on the one hand the term communication, which becomes the uh, kind of you know key defining term for um, the social system. And then in terms of the um, you know mental activities, Luhmann is using kind of you know psych- kind of you know psychological systems as you could say. So, you know, he's trying sort of, you know, to describe here the psychological processes and so forth. But he was, I think, my impression was he was never extremely happy with that um, term at the time because later on in his writings he is then using the term consciousness systems because to a certain extent you know the problem is that with the consciousness system it includes all all operations that are conscious right so whatever sort of you know is the system is unable to observe in that time so if it isn't part of these operations and to a certain extent that's something that is still sort of you know problematic with this kind of you know medium stage where he referred more to these kind of you know psychological uh, terms so i think so you know this is just a bit to give a bit of a background in terms of you know, why these different terms and traditions come from. Unfortunately, so if, you know, when we look at the, at the variety of translations, it is always translated with the term psychic systems. And yeah, so if, you know, that kind of, you know, medium stage. And as you know, the term psychic has actually quite different meaning within English. So if, you know, referring more to, um, you know, the sixth sense and so if, you know, uh, actually so if, you know, processes that don't really seem to exist in the real world. So that, you know, almost gives like a very different understanding of this one. So it was always, you know, quite problematic and in a sense not really reflecting the original meaning of the term that Sofino Luhmann had in mind. So while we were working at the translation, you know, and Sofino trying to, in a sense, um, being able to correct some of the readings of Luhmann, we also had the ability to correct Sofino some of the mistranslations in terms of, you know, some of the terms that we used at. And so, so, you know, while doing that, I tried, so, you know, to look into different terms that seemed um, more appropriate. And it's actually quite interesting when you look at the history of the word psychical, that in kind of, you know, the early days when this word became into use, so more like the late 19th century or early 20th century, it didn't, so, you know, yet have these connotations as it has today, in a sense of, you know, referring to, um, so, you know, certain unexplicable phenomena but at that time the term simply meant its processes that refer to mental pro- or like referring to mental processes right you know referring to the kind of you know psychological world and i thought you know this is actually quite an apt description of you know what luman had in mind at the time so you know when he conceptualized you know this particular term in the 1980s um and so therefore i felt as actually an opportunity here to correct so, you know, some of these translations and refer so, you know, within English to the kind of you know, earlier meanings of that term and you know, make it clearer to the reader. We are not referring to systems that can sense uh, something, I don't know, in, in the other world, right? But really so, you know, referring to just you know, certain types of mental activities that we typically so, you know, understand with the uh, meaning-making capacities of human beings. Mm. I hope that that subsequent translations by other people also follow this this in, route. Interestingly, there are actually there is a book. I think it's called the Differentiation of Society, and it's a book mm. where Luhmann was also involved in the translation. They already also used that translation. So oh. it was really, I think, the term was introduced with the translation of social systems, um, and then became, in a sense, the defining term. But uh, yeah, like I said, in the Differentiation of Society, which is book from 1982 if i'm not mistaken um and lumen was actually involved in the translation and even sophia translated certain parts of the book they already also used the term psychical in there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my final question and looking forward a little bit is that i was fortunate enough to hear you talk at an event a few months ago by the british sociology association and someone asked you about the future of Luhmann's work in the academia, if you see it staying the same or, or or becoming more popular or declining. And I remember your answer saying that we're probably, perhaps interest in Luhmann is on the decline. And should we as 
someone like me or you who is obviously interested in his work, should we just accept that as kind of the natural circle of life of a thinker or and shrug our shoulders? Or should we work and insist on his importance and hope that that others see things the way that we do? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I think, you know, when it comes to the reception of scholarly work, there are a variety of different trends that um, kind of take place. Or well, there is, let's say, what you might call the more general trend of the academic field. And, and I've referred to some of that earlier on, you know, the great, that phase of great expansion after World War II. And, um, you know, what it was really easily possible to engage with such questions, right? So I think, you know, that is quite a long-term process when you look at the institutional development of the field. And, you know, like I mentioned, from the institutional development of that field, you know, we're not only seeing, let's say, a decline in, in that kind of work in terms of Luhmann, but, you know, we're also seeing that quite across. I mean, there isn't really like a second Habermas um, there isn't really like a second Pierre Bourdieu and so forth, right? So, you know, that kind of tradition that had its height in the 1980s and let's say early 1990s hasn't yet you know, come to um, you know, similar developments. And I think that's partially due to changes within the academic system overall. But then, you know, clearly you also have these kind of, you know, um, fashion trends uh, that, for certain periods, a certain kind of sociology can be very, very popular. And often sort of, you know, that's not really driven necessarily by, you know, the work of that particular scholar, but often sort of, you know, it's driven by particular contextual developments in society itself. So for instance, again, you know, if you're using the work of Jürgen Habermas as an example, um, I mean, two of his key readings, the transformation of the public sphere and the theory of communicative action, they really you know, became only extremely influential at the end of the 1990s. Um, so, you know, leading to his you know, standing as a, as, a, as a global scholar. And I mean, partially, so, you know, that was triggered by the invention of the internet. You know, they, they, they kind of suddenly that society would experience it as a kind of global society, you know, the breakdown of the of the you know world into different kinds of blocks you know the western and the eastern block and so forth and also if you know these developments let's say you know the internet and the kind of you know, political change that could happen at that time i think seemed to inspire some sort of hope that um you know through these communication technologies and the lack of you know these superpowers that you know let's say a more bottom-up approach of you know society you know sharing and negotiating with itself what become possible. And, you know, during that time, you see, so if you know, that these concepts of communicative action and the public sphere and negotiation became extremely popular. Um, and so, if you know, had, had, had a real term impact um, and so forth. So, um, you know, that suddenly you see an enormous rise in citations of these books, you know, so these are some of the kind of, you know, fashion trends. And, and then likewise, so if you know, what you then also see is you see rediscoveries of certain scholars that then, you know, can happen. Um, you know, we see, for instance, the rediscovery of the work of um, Du Bois, um, you know, an, an um, Afro-American scholar who was largely unknown for, you know, a very long period, um, you know, being rediscovered and suddenly, so, you know, becoming um, a very, so, you know, vocal speaker that can contribute to, you know, the debates we're seeing at the moment around racism, institutional racism, and so for so again, so if, you know, these rediscoveries can happen so if, you know, in the light of these developments. But then I suppose what you also see is that patterns of receptions can actually also be quite uneven in global society itself. And I think, you know, this is what you see also you know, with the publication of this book, that Luhmann isn't necessarily well known in the Anglophone world, but for instance, he is very well known in the Spanish speaking world, right? In particular, you know, in Hispanic America. Uh, most of his books have been translated, and I think most of sociologists, most of the sociologists in in Hispanic America will know his name, right? You know, you travel to I don't know Chile or you know Mexico, and people will have heard of Luhmann. You know, the familiar sort of you know with concepts like you know functional differentiation and autopoiesis and so forth. And so you know, similarly, you will see that also he was for a certain period quite popular in the Scandinavian countries. So again, so you know, you therefore also have this kind of you know 
regional variations. And then, you know, you might have sort of, you know, scholars like ourselves, uh, you know, who are in that kind of, you know, niche and sort of, you know, seeing, you know, the relevance of his work uh, for our empirical research. And therefore, sort of, you know, can potentially contribute to a variety of different disciplines, be it, you know, in legal studies, be it in sociology, be it in management and so forth, or, you know, and therefore, you know, contributing, you know, to his, to the development of his work, maybe not necessarily in sociology, but maybe sort of in, in all these other disciplines, and um, and that's potentially also quite a positive development. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to talk to me. And I know it sounds terrible that you you've just released a book, but is there anything else that we can look forward to you from you for? So I think in terms of translations, um, you know, like book wise translations or you know book length work, um, I think so. I'm taking a bit of a break. But then um, there's a special issue about the journal Educational Theory coming out, where, which will include a translation of Lumon's work on the child, or it's called, you know, The Child, a text that he um, published in the 1990s, uh, where he also introduced actually a really interesting sociological concept uh, on medium and form. Um, and and there are like a number of um, scholars who will kind of, you know, react or reply to this particular paper. Um, and yes, yeah, so, you know, we're kind of finalizing, you know, the papers, uh, actually right at the moment. So hopefully, so, you know, that's something that should be published early next year. Oh, that sounds very interesting. I would love to see that. So Christian, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nico. It's been a real pleasure, um, talking to you.